All right, well, welcome back for another edition of Chapter 6, Logarithms. We're going to extend this into more properties. And as I mentioned last week, we're going to go ahead and first focus on what we know logarithms are in disguise. So before I actually get to that, I wanted to make sure that you all are aware what logarithms are. And so to start, remember, we had our basic y equals some base to the x power exponential function, we knew that we could rewrite that as a logarithm, okay? And if we wanted to treat this as an equation and say that we could do whatever we want to it, like take the log of both sides with any base we want, we would choose base B because whenever we have the base of the log and the thing that we're taking the log of that are the same, we learn that we could drop the bases and just have the x value, okay? So we said that we could rewrite this by switching or doing the inverse of the x and the y power to rewrite this as x equals the log of y base b. And so as we mentioned, whatever is up in the exponent, whether we call it x or y, just depends on what direction we're typically going. Notice the exponent is equivalent to our log. And so we said exponents and logarithms are one and the same. And I said logs are just exponents in disguise. So what we're gonna do is quickly review the rules. The big three, there's others of course, special circumstances which we'll get to in logarithms, but the big three rules of exponents. And if you guys remember these, hopefully we can just breeze through it. If you guys want me to expand on it and make sure that you understand it, just speak up and let me know. All right. But remember the key is, as I joked around with Megan Trainer, blast from the past, it's all about that base. And as long as the bases are the same and we're multiplying, then we said that we would do what with our exponents? Very good. Some of you were putting in the chat, add. And does everybody understand why? Well, hopefully you do. Remember, the base is not going to change. But when we're multiplying, we have more. And that's why we add. So for example, if I had, say, 2 to the third times 2 to the fifth, what does that really mean? Well, this means I have 2 times 2 times 2. And then times, we'd have 2 times 2 times itself five times. So all together, notice we have a two, my base, a bunch of times. How many times? Three here and five here for a total of eight. And so we said we would rather never do that again. So we're looking for a rule, a shortcut. And we said, as many of you did, we could just add the exponents. But notice what did not change was the base, what we were dealing with, okay? So you can probably guess what would happen if we're dividing. Since when we were multiplying, we added exponents. Again, common mistake, people will just multiply the exponents. Careful with that. When we're dividing, same idea. If I had, say, two to the fifth, and I wanted to divide by two of them, if I expanded that out, Five twos on top multiply together, two twos on bottom. And remember, one of the most important things we said in all of mathematics is multiplying by a one. And so if I have a two over two, that's a one. Two over two, that's another one. So I end up with three twos and notice where they are located. They're on top. And so that would give me two to the third, which... Again, I'd rather never do that again, because if this was 15 and this was 12 or 35 and 22, I'm not writing that out times itself 35 or 22 times and crossing out all the ones. We're looking for a shortcut. And so we saw that we could just take the top minus the bottom, same way we read, top to bottom, left to right, while keeping our base. And that would get us to this a whole lot quicker. 
Now, one thing I also wanted to mention, because a lot of people don't understand it as well, is what if it was reversed? What if we had this flip-flopped? Well, then I'd have two squared over two to the fifth, which according to this, we got a bunch of twos. How many? Two minus five, which you all know is negative three. But what is that equal to? Well, remember, if we expanded this out, we know that's two times two, and this was times itself five times, which we'd be able to cancel to become ones. And notice what is now on top is a one, and what is on bottom is three twos. And since this is equal to all of these string of things, then we know that this and this are equivalent. And that, my friends, is why we take negative exponents. And if there's not already a fraction, we move it across the division bar to make it positive or happy again. All right. So again, make sure that you understand exponents because that's all we have with logarithms in disguise. All right. So what would we do if we had? something divided by something and those bases were the same we'd keep the base and subtract from top to bottom left to right same thing that we said over here multiply we would add well then what do we do when we have something that has an exponent a power if you will and it's raised to an exponent or a power multiply very good. And again, how come? Well, let's say we had two to the fifth and it was raised to the third. Well, then we know that this right here means I'd have whatever's inside of there times itself three times. And what happens to be inside of there is two to the fifth. So if you were to say this, you would literally say that I have this three times. And if I expanded that out and expanded each one of these, I'd have two times itself, five times, three times. And that's why we just end up multiplying five times three to get however many twos we'd end up with. Or again, since we're multiplying, you could say we would just add, like we said here. And we'd have that two to the fifth, three times. So our base, again, the key, the important part, but when we have a power to a power, we end up multiplying those. And I put the dot just for emphasis so that you know what operation we're doing for each startup. And since we know that logs are just exponents in disguise, well, then what happens when we have a log and it has two things multiplied together? Well, maybe we don't know what that is, but maybe we know what each individual thing is. And so we want to split the M and the N up. Notice what will not change. What never changed in any of these things was the what? Base. That's right. So the bases will stay the same for these things. And remember, there was a caveat that it couldn't be negative or zero and we preferred it not to be one either. But the M and N, we can now take that multiplication and split it up because we know that logs are just exponents in disguise. And what happened when we were multiplying with exponents? We added each individual thing, keeping the base. What happened when we took exponents and we divided? What did we do with those exponents? We subtracted. And probably the most important one, the one that you guys will end up using the most in calculus and even the sciences, if you're going that route, what happens when we have a log, which remember is just an exponent, raised to an exponent? What did we say we would do when we had a power to a power? Multiply. But 
this is where it gets a little different. Yes, we could take that exponent in and just bring it right down and say, now it's times in. But then that kind of looks just like that, doesn't it? So to try to alleviate any confusion between those two, whether it's multiplying or multiplying, the argument, kind of like the angle and trig, versus this whole thing to a power. We want to make sure that we see that this log with this argument and this base is raised to this power of n, which it could be inside or outside. Preferably outside because then it's even more obvious. But if we're going to take that exponent and multiply it, instead of just bringing it straight down and possibly getting confused, we're going to bring it down in front so that you can literally see that this exponent in is being multiplied times this exponent in disguise, the log of m base b. So you may never have understood why they took it and brought it in front, but hopefully you do now, because we are literally just multiplying two exponents, one literal exponent and the other in disguise as a logarithm. You guys cool with that? Those are our big three, just like our big three rules of exponents. But as always, there's special circumstances, special cases, some of these which we've already done and seen and used last week when not only we were doing the homework, but the group quiz, right? So notice if I didn't know what this was equal to or this, and we just had this or this, and they wanted to know what it was equal to. Remember, anytime we have a logarithm, we want to rewrite it because exponential functions are way more comfortable than these weird logs. Okay, so if we ever had something like this, remember, if we don't know what it's equal to, we rewrite it. And how do we get rid of logs? We do the inverse. And the inverse means we keep the base, which they're saying can be anything, literally base. And to get rid of the log, we take the input and the output, which is the unknown, and we'd switch them. So now I have b to what power gives me one? And what do we say? Anything to the what power gives you one? Zero. And that's why that is an answer of zero. Very good. Now, on the other hand, what if we had this one, which notice the bases are the same? Still, we would take that input and that output to get rid of our log, and we would now say my base, B, which is down here, to what power? Because remember, that's what logarithms are, exponents. That's what we're trying to find. The log of this, which also happens to be a what? A B. And so B to what power? is ever only going to be equal to that same base, that b. Well, b to what power would give you the b, the base that you have? One. Obviously, it would be what? One. And that's why whenever the bases are the same, we literally just drop it and take the exponent as our answer, which is what the next special circumstance says. Very good, everyone that's speaking up and putting it in chat. So does everybody understand that next one there? Just drop the bases and take the exponent. How come that works? If I was to take my base and say, to what power is it equal to the log? The argument? Remember, last week we were talking about if the bases are the same, we knew that this meant everything had to be the same. So if this is the unknown part, the bases are already known, they're equal, then these have to be the same. And that's why we say that just drop them and that will be our answer. Just like we could drop these and say one is our answer. Okay, special circumstances for these. And it works in reverse. 
if this is my base and literally the log is up in the exponent, which remember that's all they are anyways. Well, then we can drop these bases and say that is also our answer. Okay, very important, probably the most important part that you will use in calculus and your science classes, but these are special circumstances that save us from having to write things out and do all of this rewriting. We can literally, I'd be fine with you guys doing this. That would be enough for you to show me your work. Just literally crossing out the log and the basis. Okay, that would show me that you know these. All right. Any questions on any of that? Because, of course, you're going to have to use these things and in different ways and cases, whether there already are logs or we have to introduce logs. We got to take the log of both sides and choose the base that we want so that we can drop this and figure out what the exponent is. Okay. So there's one more thing that we're going to talk about using these to expand, rewrite it in a bigger form, expanding it, because we now know individual things rather than the original thing that they gave us. Condensing it, taking a bunch of single logs and building it down to just one single log. And then evaluating or simplifying them if we can. All right, we'll even use these things to solve equations. But the last thing that we're going to talk about in this section is something called the change of base theorem or formula. And it's a pretty cool one. I'm not going to derive it for you, but if you want to look it up, you can. The change of base says, well, what do we say are the most commonly used bases in the entire world? 10. Very good. But there's also another one that we naturally like to use. E. Natural E. Very good. Now, if you pull out your calculator or if you've been using your phone, you'll have to take it, whether it's an Apple iPhone or an Android device, and you'll have to take it and put it horizontally to come up with some of those other things like logs and trigs, all those other square roots and things that aren't just real quick and easy, adding, subtracting, multiplying, dividing. If you turn it horizontally, it'll come up with logs. If you look at your calculator, what logs are the only ones that your calculator uses? Common and natural. Very good. So if we are using our calculator, we're going to have to use either of these. And I haven't finished grading all of your group quizzes, but I warned you all, some of you were putting I in. And I got pissed. And I went blah, blah, blah all over your paper. Okay. Be careful. Remember, it's an LN. These are all logs. But if we write it like this or we write it like this, we're letting you know that the base is what if it's just LOG? 10. It's a base of 10. And if it's LN, it's still a log, but what's the N? E. Very good. Some of you were putting it in the chat and spoke up. Beautiful. Those are the only two that most calculators, unless you're going to pay top dollar for one, it'll do all of them. Which means we needed something to change the base, no matter what we're given. So it's pretty cool. Just make sure that you understand anytime you have the log of something with any base, we want to be able to change it in one of two ways. Either to the common log, base 10, or the natural log, base E. And here's how we do it. It's pretty nice, pretty easy. You just take what you had, which is the log of M. But then to get rid of this base that you had, 
and change it to any one you want, you basically have to divide it out. You got to get rid of it. So we're going to divide by the log of our base. And this, my friends, is called the change of base. And you can change it to anything you want. But in reality, what are the only two that we want? And any. Which means I will keep it as that. Or I could rewrite it as the natural log of M. And divide out the base that I had. And so these are one and the same. Notice they are all equivalent, which means whether you have this, this, or that, you should get the same number out. So for example, if I had something like this, let's just do one real quick. Let's say I had the log of eight base two. Does everybody know what the answer to that is? One fourth. One two, four. What are logarithms looking for? What are logarithms in disguise? Exponents. They're exponents. So I want to know what exponent for what base? Two. Two would give me this out right the way that we would rewrite this is two to what power gives me the eight and now you all see the answer is three like jacob had already put in the chat right this is what i need you guys to be able to see immediately and just put this right like when my kids were younger and you know people would say hey you're so cute how old are you and they'd go this many I told them to say log eight base two. All right. Really throw them for a loop. Well, you're, you're how old? Not this many. Log eight base two. No, I'm kidding. They didn't, they didn't do that. But that would be funny, wouldn't it? <laughs> Barrett's like, I'm doing that. I'm teaching. Yeah, you. I'm going to start training mine to do that. <laughs> the square root of four. No. So these are the things that we need to be able to do. And I chose something that we know because I want to prove it to you, okay? We know that this is three, but let's use that change of base to do this or this. And if we were in class, I would split you guys right down the middle and I'd say this half do it with natural log and then this half do it with the common log, okay? I don't have a way to split you, so just pick one, punch it in your calculator and make sure that you get something that we know. And of course, we're not going to do this when we can just say the answer is three. We can rewrite it and get our answer of three. We're looking to do this when it's a five. What's the log of five base two? Well, I don't know. Two to what power gives me a five? Well, I know two to the first gives me a two. And two to the... Let me rewrite that. Sorry. Log of five base two, we don't know. And so since we're looking for two to the what gives me five, I can pinch it. This is called the squeeze theorem between two things I do know. I do know two to the second is really close. But two to the third, it's too much. So since what we're trying to find is five, and we know eight and four, or by these things, we know our answer has to be between two and three. And a lot closer to two than three, isn't it? But we don't want an approximates. We want exact answers. So if I was to rewrite this, what would I get? Log of what on top? Eight. Over the log of what on bottom? Two. Very good. A lot of people are putting it in chat as well. Or I could have done the natural log of eight over the natural log of two and punch that into your calculator. What do you know? Each one of these should come out. J. 
just like we said originally, we knew the answer to this was. Two to what power gave us eight? We knew it was three. And that's what each of these, no matter which one, according to our change of base theorem, should also be equivalent to. All right, so hopefully you got those in your calculator. Hopefully you know how to use it. And remember the calculators, most of them, unless you got a big fancy graphing calculator, will only do a base of 10 or E. All right, that's the first section. 6.6 .6 is going to talk about exponential and logarithmic equations. Now, before we've just had things that were open-ended. What is the log of eight base two? And we told them the answer by evaluating that was three. But now we're gonna start off with what we already mentioned last time, whether it's an exponential equation or now in this section, we'll add in log equations. Remember this, if we have a base to a power and it's equal to that same base, but to a different power, what did we say this meant? Very good in the chat. Alex said the same. What has to be the same? The exponent. That is correct, but I'm looking for a one word answer. Don't just say exponents. This means that everything, that's the answer I was looking for, has to be the same. They're equivalent. And you guys focus on the exponents because what you already know was equal. The bases. So we literally just drop them and concentrate on what we don't know in the form that they're in are the same. And that's why we said that the exponents also had to be equal. So you remember we did problem like this in our group quiz quite a few times last week. Some of you guys had a little bit of trouble with one that I gave you like this, so I wanted to go over it one more time. Okay, If I have a 5 to a power, and it's saying that it's equal to 25 to a power, can I just drop these and say 2x has to be equal to 3x plus 2? No way. Those are not the same, so we can't just disregard them. But what we can try to do is get them to be the same. Remember, you can't change what you have, but you can change the look of it. Okay? With a little diet and exercise, anybody can change the way they look. Right? Same thing here. Five, I'm going to keep that as five to the two X because I know that I can also change this which is 25 to the 3x plus 2, to look a little bit different. That 25, I can also write as 5 to a power. But before you just go dropping things, remember the stuff we reviewed at the beginning, the section before this, we took and said any time we had a power to a power, we would what? Multiply. Very good. And since that two is going to multiply to those two things out there, we will now have five to the two X equals five to the six X plus four. And now there are some things that we already know are equivalent or the same, and that's the fives. So we will literally drop those and set, like you all mentioned, the exponents the same. And now we can solve. Remember the big secret to math is you're trying to get one equation with just one variable so that you can solve for that variable. Okay, that's going to come back again later today when we talk about the first section of chapter 11. So your choice on how you solve this, but just remember you want to try to get 
the X is on one side and everything else on the other. So whether you work with negatives or not, it's up to you. I'm gonna go ahead and just subtract six X so that I only have one step to get the X's. Just be careful. Don't just try to force everything to be positive. And then we would have to divide by that negative four to get our positive one X for an answer of negative one. Okay, and we know that that is true because if we plug that in there and there and tested it, we would see that this side is equal to that side. All right, so be careful. Those are the things that we talked about last week, introduced it because now we're gonna not just have exponential equations to solve. We're now gonna have these new ones. Um, oh. can I, Go sorry, ahead, Jose. Can, I, can you scroll down a little bit? I didn't fully see it. Absolutely. Uh, okay. Um, where you did a 4x uh, over the 4, uh, is it plus or minus, even though it's negative? I, I wasn't. Yeah, so I initially do the different colors so that you could see the next step, right? And every one. Yeah. So we had this equals this, which is up here. Yeah, I subtracted I the 6x to get negative 4x equals yeah. 4 in green. Okay, um, and then when you divided, was is it a positive four or is it does it stay a negative four? It was negative, but when I divide a negative by a negative, it became okay. positive. Okay, thank you. You got it. And we did that so that we could get our x by itself. All right. Good question. So just like we had this, what they call one-to-one -one property for exponential functions, where when the bases were the same, we dropped them and concentrated on our exponents. Now, we're gonna talk about the one-to-one -one property for logs. And you can imagine it's very, very similar. If we have the log equals a log, what do you think is the most important thing? The base. All about that base. Thank you, Julian. And as long as the bases are the same with those logs, then just like we did with the exponentials, we can drop those bases and those logs and concentrate on the arguments of those logs, the S and the T, okay? But this can get kind of messy, so be careful. You can't just drop logs anywhere. That's disgusting. Sorry, crappy joke. Uh, when you are going through these logs, remember, sometimes you'll have equations that have multiple logs. And the biggest mistake is people will just take those logs and everywhere they see them, they'll just drop them. The only time, if and only if this works, is when you have a single log equals a single log, just like we had a single base equals a single base and we're able to drop those. So make a note of that, has to be a log equals a log in order to drop and concentrate on that S and T. Don't drop logs all over the equation, right? Then you'll have trouble. Now, of course, Anytime we have logs in our equation, we do want to get rid of them. So there's another circumstance that sometimes you won't have logs on both sides of your equation and be able to drop them and just concentrate on the other things, the arguments they call it. But sometimes you'll have just a single log. But guys, remember, we already know how to get rid of a single log. We just take its inverse, which means we take the input and the output and we invert them, reverse their order. That's how we get rid of a single log, which means we now have our base to the C equals our S. None of that has changed. That's the very first thing I reviewed with you all today, right? If you wanna get rid of your log, what do you do? Switch the input and the output and keep your base. When do we have to do that? when we only have one log, 
when can we just drop logs? When we have a single log equals a single log, then we can concentrate on their arguments, the pieces that were attached with them. And remember the key is they have to have that same base. All right? So that's pretty much it for this section. Not a whole lot new, but remember we do have to make sure that we know how to solve these equations, not just evaluate logs. So now that I have, what is that? Natural log. And remember it's an LN, not a capital I, okay? It's still a logarithm. It's just the natural log, meaning it has a base of what? E. Very good. And as long as the bases are the same and we have the log of this equals the log of this, well, then we already know that the logs are the same. So we can just drop those and concentrate on these being equal. And so that's what we're going to do. We're going to drop those since the bases are the same, just like we did last week. And we're going to take the x squared equals 2x plus 3 and solve. Now, the problem is we like to get the x's on the same side like I just did before, but there's an x and an x squared. And when we have an x squared and an x, what do we have to do to try to solve this type of equation? Quadratic. Good, it is a quadratic. And if we want, we can use the quadratic formula, but we prefer the fastest way. And what is the fastest way? Square root. Not quite, Annalie, because if I square root this side, you're right, I would have x, but I also have an x in my answer, and that doesn't play well. I want to know what x is. You can't tell me it's this. So what do we have to do to get the x squared and the x? Factor. Factor out an x. Very good. But before we factor out an x, we got to get it set equal to what? Zero. So on both sides of my balance beam, my equation, I want to subtract 2x so that that cancels out and subtract 3 so that that cancels out. And as long as I do it equally to both sides, now, as some of you were saying in the chat, we can either factor, complete the square, somebody even added, very good. And of course, since it is a quadratic equation, we can use the quadratic formula. I'd rather not do any of those things and just factor it because that's our quickest, easiest method. And by factoring, I'm not gonna factor out an X as a few of you were saying, because there's this number here too. And if I factor an X out of this and this, I'm still left with an X inside. So we're gonna factor this trinomial to look like a binomial times a binomial. Remember, factoring is just the inverse, the reverse of distributing. So I know if I had an x here and an x here, when I FOIL or distribute, I'd get my x squared. What would I have to put here and here that when I distribute those, I'd get a negative 3? Negative 3 and positive 1. And why did you choose the 3 to be negative, Lilian, and the 1 to be positive? Because when you add... Um... When you factor it, you would have um, negative three minus or po Ugh, sorry. You're good. This is hard to explain. You got it. You were you're right there. X squared minus negative three plus uh, X squared minus negative three X plus positive one X minus three. So you would add the, the negative three and the one to get a negative two. X. Excellent. Nice job. The x squared we got, the negative three we got. The part that she was talking about was that middle, that negative two x that we also have to worry about. And when we distribute the negative three to the x, like she mentioned, we'd have a negative three x. And when we took the negative, excuse me, the positive one times the other x, we would get a positive one x to get that negative two x's we had to get in the middle. Now, why do we do all of that? 
Because remember, the name of the game is to get a single equation with a single unknown. And even though there was an x squared and an x, and we had that one equation, there wasn't a single unknown. But by setting it equal to zero, we knew the only time that this times this would equal zero is when either this is equal to zero and or that is equal to zero. And now we have our one equation with just one x. And so what are our answers to finish this off? Three and negative one. Why did you switch them? I thought it was negative three and positive one. In order to get zero. them to be zero, you have to switch the sign. Very good, you two. To get this equal to zero, we'd have to put in a positive three because we know three minus three would be zero. To get this to be a zero, we'd have to put in a negative one to get to zero. So that's why the sign always switches. Now, don't forget when we were graphing these logs, which is what we did last week. Remember, logs had that one zero here. And if it was increasing, it was this way. If it was decreasing, it was this way. It had that vertical asymptote, which meant our domain had to be everything to the right of zero. Which means, should the alarms be going off on our head when we get an answer of negative one for our x? Yes, they should. But that doesn't mean that we automatically throw it out just because it's negative and say our only answer is three. So pay attention right here. Just because it's negative does not mean you throw it out. I'm glad you're even thinking about doing that because most people would just circle these, move on, and unfortunately get the whole thing wrong. So how do we know when we need to toss an answer or keep it? That's what this part says. Always check to see if it's correct or what is called an extraneous solution. We didn't actually solve the equation they gave us because we couldn't. So we dropped what we deemed unnecessary and we took what we knew we could solve. And eventually we did. But remember to check if these work for the original equation, we have to plug them in. And I'm not telling you to check every single one of these. Check the ones that you're kind of not sure of. And because we graphed logs and knew that they had that vertical asymptote, increasing or decreasing, everything had to be to the right of positive, to the right of zero. This should have had an alarm go off in your head. So how do we check it without actually checking it? Make sure that we only know how to take logs of what? Positive real numbers. Very good. As long as it's any base, we have the log of a positive number, then it should work. We're going to trust all the other stuff we did. I'm not even going to test this one. I'm certain it's going to work. But this one, how am I going to quote unquote test it? What happens when you take a negative one and square it? What do you get? Positive. Good. Careful. What happens when we put a negative one in here? Yeah, negative, one. negative two plus three is actually going to be what? Positive one. Which is fine because it's also positive. And notice, by the way, that we got. I'm distracted right now. <laughs> So am I, that cute little baby popping her head in. That negative one, when we put it in here and here, what did we end up taking or would have been taking the natural log of? What happens when you put a negative one in and square it? We got one. What happened when we put the negative one in here? We got negative two plus three, which is also one. And yes, my friends, not only can we take the natural log of each of those, we know they're going to be the same. Okay, so don't stress about actually working them out and getting numbers. Make sure that anytime you see something that could yield for this and that, 
a negative, which we cannot take the log of with any base, then you would have to toss it and say, this is my one and only answer. Or you may have to sometimes toss both and say that there is no solution. Does that make sense? Hopefully we're all good with the testing of that. All right, cool. On to the last section of chapter six, which unfortunately means now that we've talked about how to evaluate exponential analogs, which remember are just inverses of each other, we talked about how to graph them. We talked about how now to solve them using different forms of their equations. Well, now, lastly, we need to talk about how to use them in different real life situation models, AKA word problems. So how can we use some of this stuff in the real world? Well, hopefully you recognize this. That form of an equation, is that a log exponential? What kind of equation? Exponential. Yeah, you can probably read. Very good, Julian. It's right there. But hopefully you notice they used a base of what? Zero. No. Oh, uh, E. Yeah, very good. The A sub zero represents one original amount. Okay, that's going to be what is called our coefficient that we've been talking about in the past. But remember, we wrote it as a little a. And then the e is our base, which remember is just about what? About three. Very good. Little more or a little less? Less. Excellent. So this form, hopefully you recognize, is just this. You guys remember that formula? Compound interest. Very good. And it was compounded what? Continuous. Continuously. Very good. And the P stood for the principal, the initial amount. They're just using a different letter. The A stood for the ending amount. They're using a different form that we're more mathematically inclined to seeing y equals the rate and the time they also changed up a little bit they use the coefficient k up there because what we're going to be talking about is that rate k If it's greater than zero, that means it's positive, which means it's going to increase. If it's less than zero, then that means it's negative, which means it's going to decrease. And if you guys remember what happens when we have a negative number up there, if K was negative, what do we do with negative exponents? Um, I have a question. One second, Jose. Yeah, okay. Very good. So if I have e to the negative kt, we know that we would take that and flip it, which means we would have 1 over e to the kt. And what happens when you take and divide your original thing? That a sub 0? What do we get when we divide by things? Bigger numbers or smaller numbers? Smaller which is why it would decrease when that K is zero. For each time, as the time increases, right, then that K, if it was negative, would make our initial amount that we would have, because we're dividing, it would decrease. 
over time. Where if that K is positive, then it's going to stay up there. And that would, for multiplying by three-ish to a power, we know it's going to grow and it's going to grow quickly. Okay, go ahead, Jose. Thanks for waiting. Yeah, um, when you're saying increasing and decreasing, how, how is, like, if we find a question like this, will it have the, like, K is greater or, like, less than, or do we just, how do we figure that out? Yeah, it's a very good question. Excellent. And, again, thanks for waiting because I just wanted to get through that. No, they will not always tell you. Okay. okay. Sometimes they'll say it in a different way. Sometimes they'll flat out tell you, but they won't always give it to you. So very good, Jose. We will see a couple of different looks of this, all right? And I'll show you what uh, a few of them look like, and we'll even name some, okay? Some of you guys are obviously into the sciences. That's why you're even taking these classes and going to move on to calculus is because they're required, right? How many of you guys are into biology? Anybody out there? I'm not into it, but I have to take it. <laughs> yep. For sure. I, I agree with that statement. Go ahead, Julian. With uh, like uh, pH and stuff. Cool. pH. Have you guys heard of half life before? Yeah. What does half life represent? Decaying. It's it, decaying, which means uh, it's decreasing. Yeah. By how much, Julian? exponentially or half there you go good you're correct about both but i was looking for the latter right by half each what time and that's the thing that's going to change right whether that time is in hours days years decades centuries it depends on the element that we're talking about right and some people do this for a living. When there's a death and they want to know how long somebody has been dead because it's a murder, right? Or you guys have probably seen CSI, take your favorite big city, right? Miami, Chicago, LA, they got them all, right? New York. That's what those people go in and do. They try to figure out how long somebody's been perished. And what they can do is figure out using some of this stuff, this half-life, because we already know how a certain thing decays. It takes a certain number of years. And so they can measure how much is left and how much we know we all start with, do some calculations and figure out within reason, of course, it's not going to be an exact science, as they say, right? And that's what we're going to be able to figure out is what would the half light be for a certain element what is that decay rate and remember it's a rate they're just using k for a different form so half life what if i wanted to solve for k in this equation what would i start by doing What does half-life mean again, Julian? Half. So whatever this is, let's say we start with 100% of it, right? And we wanted to solve for K. What do I know my ending amount would have to be if we're dealing with half-life? 50. Very good. Every single time, it will be 50. Right, whatever that time is minutes, hours, days, years, whatever. So, in this case, I know that let's say it's 100. Well, then I know that this is going to be 50. Now, is it always going to be 100 to 50? No, what if it was 10? Then it would be five, right? But no matter what this is, this would always be half of that. And so, if I took it and just divided by it, this would cancel out, and we would just end up with half. I like actually plugging in numbers so you guys can see it a little bit better. Because now I know I'm going to divide by 100 to both sides. Why can I do that? Well, it's an equation. I can do whatever I want. 
and it's being multiplied. So if I divide by 100, that cancels. On one side, I get one half. On the other, e to the kt. Now remember, it's an equation. If I want to keep it equal, I got to do whatever I do to one side, the same as the other. So that's why I divided by 100 to get rid of this and start to try to get that k by itself. Now remember, how many unknowns, how many variables are there left? Very good, Barrett. Only two. Remember, e is a number. It's not a variable, even though it's a letter like a lot of the others. Okay? What should I do now? And keep in mind what we're trying to solve for. I will highlight it for you. We're trying to solve for k. And where is k located? In that spot. And if I want to get an exponent down out of the exponent, what would I have to do in order to do that? And a few of you are putting in the chat, very good. What would it be? How do we get exponents down and out? What do we need to have? A negative. Good. Can I just put a negative up here? No, that's not something that I can do, even though I could try to do. I don't have an exponent over here. But what can I do is, as a few of you put in the chat there, is I can introduce logs. And I can introduce any log with any base I want as long as I do it equally to both sides. But what are the two that we prefer? 10 and E, because those are what I can do on my calculator. But because this already has a base of E, which should I definitely choose? E. Good. Not the common log. Even though I could take this and bring it down in front, because remember, logs are just exponents in disguise. So since I have something, I can bring that power down and multiply times that log of e base 10. And I'd have a log of 1 half over here. And then I could get that k by itself by doing a bunch of dividing to both sides. But that's nasty. What I'd rather do is take the natural log of both sides because now I have the base of e that I already have there, which now allows me to drop them as we talked about at the beginning of today which is even cleaner because now all i have is my exponent down out of the exponents now um i have another question yes sir uh is it always half or is it only because of this question only because of this question we're just trying to find what k will always be anytime they say what have life. You got it. All right, thank you. You got it. Now that formula right here is what we can always use for exponential growth or decay. But we want to say for half-life, what would the decay rate be? And so we're trying to find what that K is for decay rate. Now I left this a little open-ended because I don't like the fact that it's a fraction. So as Barrett mentioned a little while ago, what could I do with that one half to get rid of the fraction? Very good. I could say, move it across and put it as two to the negative one. And even though that is still one half, does everybody agree? What else could I do to get rid of that to not looking so ugly? Move the negative one to the front. Very good, since that's an exponent in disguise and that is raised to it, I could bring it down in front. So my rewriting of this would be kt equals a negative natural log of two. Then I don't even need the parentheses. 
the fractions and getting confused with bases and whatnot. And what's my last step in this? What was my whole goal of doing any of this? It's not okay. Divide by two. Which means since it's being multiplied to solve for K, I would divide by T and that would give me what the decay rate is. Like Jose mentioned, when, when is that going to only be that decay rate? When we're dealing with that half-life. Which means what's the only thing that you need to know in order to solve for that decay rate? Time. You would only need to know the time. Very good. So how are we going to use this? Another good question by Jose, right? What kind of looks are we going to get? Of course, I will have some in the group quiz that I want you guys to work out, but they will give you different parts of this. And then they will ask you to solve for different. And remember, there's one, two, three, four variables up there. Two of them in the exponent. Two of them not. E is not a variable. So make sure that you have a note of that at some point. If they're going to ask us for any one of these four, they're going to have to give us the other three, either directly or indirectly. All right. And by indirectly, I mean, do they actually have to tell us K if they tell us half-life? No, and we already did all the work for it, guys. So make sure that you have this written down. That's what K is equal to, because then you don't have to go through all of this with the numbers that they give you. What's the only thing that Barrett reminded us that we needed in order to solve for K? Time. Very good. And if they tell us half-life and they tell us the time it takes for that thing to be cut in half over and over and over and over again, then in a way, they gave us both K and T, didn't they? Which means if they give us our initial amount that we started with, we can give them after any amount of time what we would end up with, what amount, okay? So that is it for chapter six, my friends. And we're gonna move on to the very last section, which is 11.1. For today, this is the first section of chapter 11, and it's going to go back to your algebra one when it got a little bit hard. Okay, hopefully it didn't get too difficult for you in algebra one, but this is when we added a second variable, which meant we needed to add a second equation. And we're going to just start with lines. Okay, and then we'll up the ante a little bit with some of the other things that we talked about. There's three different scenarios that can happen when we're drawing two lines, okay? What happens most of the time? They intersect. Because what do lines never do? Can't stop, won't stop, okay? They go wrapping around the entire world if we were able to draw it, okay? So this line here, continues in both directions and this line here. Now, what does it mean to solve an equation? You give me that one answer. So if I gave you this equation over here and I said, all right, 2x plus five equals, let's say 11. You'd subtract the five, you divide by two and you tell me the one and only x that would make this true. But then we got so good at that, we said, you know what? Let's take that 2x and let's add a y into it. And let's say now that's equal to 10. Now how many solutions did we have? By adding another variable, were there only two answers?
That's confidence if I ever heard it. Come on, guys. This is basic algebra here. Can you repeat it one more time? You got it, Jose. It's been 12 years since I took it. It doesn't matter. That means your mind should be even better than it was 12 years ago, Barrett. No excuses. If I have one equation with one variable, we know how to solve it. And there's only going to be, by it, one solution. What happens when we take something like this and we add a second variable? Now, how many solutions are there? Two solutions. And that's what most people say. That's Infinite what a lot of people solutions. are putting in the chat. Go Infinite ahead. Infinite solutions. Very good. Excellent. It's not just two just by adding a second variable. Now, a lot of you can look at this and give me two. Give me two answers to this. Zero and two. Five comma zero. Would that work? Yeah. Five in for the X, zero in for the Y. That's going to give me 10. Give me another one. Zero, two. Now, according to Samantha and a few others in the chat, those should be the only two answers. Is there anything else? You can get into like negative numbers. Guys, what if we plotted those points? What if I actually went over here and I plotted zero two and plotted that? What can I draw? A line. Why? Why do we draw lines? Why do we graph? What does every single point on this line represent? Just like those two do. A solution. Very good, Itzel. It's a solution. So by adding a second letter doesn't mean we just get two answers. As James mentioned, we actually get an infinite amount. Now, with an infinite amount, does that mean anything works? Anything that falls in within the slope? Very good. Only the things on these lines, which is why we graph. So if you look at this line here in blue and this one in orange, what do these points that when we draw consecutively like that represent? All the solutions to each of those linear equations. What are we going to be looking for if we are given two equations? We're going to be looking for the one thing, the one solution that works for both. And where is that one solution going to happen? At their what? On the intersection. Very good. At their intersection, that one X comma Y. But guys, here's the problem. <laughs> Look at that answer. Would you have seen, if you graphed those two lines, which we know how to do, would you have seen that this is exactly that? Would you have known it's 7 fifths common negative 11? No. No. And that's why we don't graph. Can we graph? Yes. Can we find the place where they intersect exactly? Not as well. Not unless we have graph paper a straight edge like a ruler and we're very precise even still that's going to be nasty to find so that's why we introduced two different techniques in algebra called does anybody remember how we solve these systems of equations when there's more than one Remember the other one when I've written that now? I want to say synthetic. That sounds like it. Close, James. Elimination. Oh, I'm not yeah, sure. Okay. Okay. Good guess. It is substitution and elimination. 
And guys, keep in mind what we only know how to solve is one equation with one unknown. So even though we're going to be given two unknowns with two equations, the same x and y, we're going to have to try to get it down to one equation with one unknown. And these are the two techniques. Graphing is another, but as you can see, it's not very good. So this is the case that's going to happen most of the time. We call it an independent system because this equation and this equation are independent of one another. But there's also two special cases. And those two special cases are when the two lines have the same what? Slope. Very good. If their slopes are the same, but they don't have the same y-intercept. Why did I mention the slope and the y-intercept? We prefer lines to be in this form, don't we? Because then we know what the graph of them looks like. We know how they behave. So the slope of these things are parallel, but you can't even see the two lines on this because what does the orange and the blue do? Slide one over on top of the other. Now they have the same slope, but they also share the same y-intercept, which means they are what? The same line. The same line, very good. So we call that a dependent system because they depend on one another because they are the same line, okay? How many solutions are we anticipating getting? One. Most of the time, one solution, some X comma Y. How many solutions will we have in the special cases? Well, if this represents all the solutions for the blue line, and this represents all the solutions for the orange line, and we're looking for the one solution that works for both, this doesn't have any. And do you guys know the symbol that we use for no solution? Zero with a strike threat. Very good, which some of you are still writing this as zero. Okay, please don't put that. That means something different in math no solutions or it's also called the empty set where you draw two curly braces and say there are no answers look there's nothing in it but what about with the other special case when the two lines are on top of one another how many solutions are there then infinite now very good but does that give me a whole lot Hey man, how many how many answers are there? To, oh, there's a lot. No, that that isn't that's not good enough, right? We want a little bit better answer. So what we're going to tell them is not just an infinite amount. We're going to say, you know what? Pick an x, any x you want, and I'll tell you what the other part of the solution is. And what is the other part of every single one of these solutions? It's the y value. Which means, unfortunately, what does that require us to do in order to tell them that? Take one of those, either one, because they're the same. So pick the easiest of the two lines or equations and solve for y. So you're going to give them what the y value is in terms of x. Does that make sense? We could just say like we did in Algebra 1, ah, there's an infinite amount. But remember, that does not mean anything works. The only things that work are going to be the ones on this particular line. So we'll tell them, pick any x you want. Here's how you find your y. It's 2x plus 3 or negative 3 halves x minus 2. All right? So that's it in a nutshell. With those three techniques, we're not going to use graphing because it's hard to be exact and get those exact answers. So we will use that substitution method. 
which means we will take and solve for any one of my variables. Again, choose the easiest one. And then this is why it's called the substitution method. We will then replace it in the other equation. Don't plug it back into your original one that you manipulated and solve for X or Y. Students do that often. And they're like, oh, I got one of those special cases. Like, no, 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 be careful with that. Because ultimately, what do we say we want and need? A single equation with only one variable. That's what we know how to solve. All right. Let me highlight that. The other technique that we have as an option is called the elimination or addition method. And we will take and add the two equations. Because we know that the two sides of the equation are equal, if we take the other one and add those two sides, which we know are equal, then the sum of those two sides will also be equal. But again, our goal is to eliminate one of our variables to, again, obtain one equation with just one variable. That's the trick to math. All right, everybody got that? Hopefully you remember it because that is it as far as what we're going to be covering in this section.